Now this is the Sydney P-Class tram. This was the final design of a uh, crossbench car for Sydney, became their ultimate design. There were 258 of these cars constructed between 1922 and 1929. This one, of course, as the number tells us, was uh, 1,497th electric car in service. Now, the first two cars, the first one was constructed by Everly Railway Workshops and the second one by Ramwick Tramway Workshops. And these two sample cars were amended considerably uh, and altered and worked upon before the production batches which started to come out in 1922 appeared on the scene. There was necessity to make quite a few amendments to the body design. Now there are two features on the front of the tram that we'll look at while we're in this position. Firstly the destination box. You'll recall on the O cars the boxes were on the front here in an exposed position. Now of course with these the more modern uh, built-in box appeared on the top of the tram which gave it a much more aesthetic appearance. And the second more important thing was the Tomlinson coupler. Now the story behind these is simply that in 1918 the department sent its engineers around the world to gather in the latest information and technology on tram car construction. And uh, whilst in New York they noted the New York Elevated Railway had just put some cars into service featuring these couplers. And the advantages of these over the old method is uh, considerable. You'll recall on the E cars we had all these big jumper cables hanging out permanently coupled between them. Uh, on the O car we had the two uh, air pipes up here and the electrical contactor there which was a bit of an improvement but still quite cumbersome. But on these we had everything in one compact coupler. So with one of these on either tram and the coupler in a central, central position, all you had to do was drive the two trams together, coupled up, and that was all there was in it. The features on the coupler are the centre hook, which actually physically joined the two trams together. Then we had two locking pins. There were two pins on each lock on each coupler and they of course would poke into a hole on the opposing coupler. There's the two holes there on our one. Then we had the electrical contactors which were spring loaded, which meant of course that when the uh, two couplers joined together, the springs would have perfect electrical contact by holding them out. And uh, finally, the train and main pipes, our two air pipes on our controller, one at the top and one at the bottom, on our coupler, I should say. So once having joined it together, it only took a matter of three or four seconds your tram was hooked up compared to the previous methods of lumbering all these big heavy cables around. Well now we're going to move the tram forward and we'll have a look at some of the features of the body. Now the other uh, major achievement that the engineers brought back from the United States, apart from the Tomlinson coupler, was the electro-pneumatic control equipment which was fitted to this uh, car or to this class of car. Now to the layman this simply meant that underneath the tram was a master unit which did all the work. In the cab the driver would throw the control handle around and then I guess in theory he could sit down and read the telegraph because the tram would do the rest of the work. The master unit taking over underneath and accelerating the tram accordingly and then all he had to do was cut off and apply the brake at the end uh, and all the work was done for him. So this was quite a, an advancement on the old method of uh, electrically, electrical operation of our tram cars up to that period. But to you and I, the only visible changes uh, that were brought about by this uh, tram car and uh, they were considerable at the time was in the body construction. <clears throat> now these, uh, these bodies were constructed on what I tend to call the prefabricated process. In other words, they were made in six parts, the roof, the two sides, the two ends, and the floor unit. Now these were all constructed out on the workshop floor on jigs to their completed stage. They would simply then place the frame or the floor unit on the two workshop dollies, lift the sides on with a crane, sit them down, screw up the bolts on the bottom, these three uprights then were sticking up at the top. They would lower the roof down with a crane and it fitted onto the three uprights and they then screwed them, screwed the roof onto them. Now all of this was all very good and it certainly uh, halved the time of body construction but with the passage of time of course it had its detrimental effects. Firstly the screws holding these uprights in the roof became quite loose and you had a tremendous amount of body movement so that the roof would keep on going when the tram stopped and when the tram took off the roof would go backwards and this had its problem with the windows 
because these glass panels would move around inside the frame and I'll show you in a minute uh, what a problem that was. The other thing was uh, the metal panels. Now these metal panels here are purely to keep the weather out and decoration. They do not stabilize the tram in any way. You only have these three uprights uh, which hold the side of the tram up and you'll notice here there's two bolts here and one here they go right through the seats like so and that holds the cross bracing that holds the body sides together so these panels were purely nothing but decoration so as the side of the tram wore towards the end of the second world war in the late 40s became quite a problem they came up with the idea of stabilizing the sides by welding a steel panel this solid steel panel here was welded onto the side of the tram one here one on the corresponding side and two down the other end of the tram and this braced the body and made it quite rigid. <coughs> the idea was that uh, all of the P cars would be uh, attended in this way but actually only about 50 or 55 of them were done by the time they'd got that far the decision to scrap the P's had been made and no more cars were done. Now this particular car uh, has a claim to fame. Uh, back in the early 1950s somebody invented a contrivance or a substance called fiberglass and they decided they would uh, experiment with the fiberglass roofing on the tram rather than the canvas roofs which the trams had prior to that. So this tram was chosen as the experimental one, was fitted with a fiberglass roof and I'm happy to say that some, what are we now, 30, 40 odd years later the fiberglass is still in perfect condition. So I can assure you that the uh, trial was quite successful and uh, had the trams remained in service they would all now have fiberglass roofs instead of the old canvas roofs. So we've got the one example that the department had. Now I will demonstrate uh, a humorous little sidelight to the body movement. I'll just get inside and I'll show you what happened. Then you can do your... Normally when you sat in the tram you tended to sit in and rest your hand on the side like so. This sheet of glass would move up and if you weren't careful and you got your finger in that little slot there when the tram pulled up and the sheet of glass came down it chopped the top off your finger. So that was quite a bit of a problem which uh, uh, regular travellers were aware of but visitors from uh, overseas or interstate uh, found out to their uh, amazement when the tip of their finger disappeared. Alright now we're going to have a look at uh, a couple of other features of the tram which made them uh, different at the time. <coughs> And Darren will show us now uh, a famous reenactment, actually, for those who've seen one of our earlier videos. Uh, what we have is the windows. Now, prior to this, the windows were fitted in the doorways, but as you can see here, we have a window which slides up and down, and we have a canvas concertina door, which opened and closed with great simplicity and didn't rattle like the O-car doors did. So these two improvements were uh, something that the travelling public really appreciated because as I'd showed you earlier, if you pull the big canvas door down on the O's or the K's, uh, you sort of locked yourself in a tomb and you couldn't see out. Whereas here, uh, at least with the canvas doors closed, you could see out of the windows and they were quite an, uh, an achievement. In fact, when the corridor cars came out, what doors were on it were still retained as the canvas thing. Now the only other feature that we can mention out here is the frame. Once again, uh, they adopted the uh, truss frame which was uh, much better than the old uh, plate frame. In fact, it was a lot lighter and therefore you had a better uh, weight ratio passenger per, uh, per pound. All right, now that's about all we can say about the P car. We'll move it out. Oh, one other thing just before we leave. There's something else I have to tell you about and that's the seats. These seats were designed by the Sydney University and we are told they were designed to fit the average human anatomy. Well, the only problem is that we're yet to find an average human being because if you try and sit in these seats in the manner in which they were designed, you'll end up with spinal trouble. I can assure you they are terrible. <laughs>